Good evening, everybody, and welcome to another ZFA conversation. My name is Bren Cardell, and I am the Director of Public Affairs at the Zionist Federation. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I speak, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Knowing that this conversation is being watched in every Australian state, I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands on which people are watching this. Tonight, we will be talking to two people with different perspectives on the ramifications of the recent US withdrawal from Afghanistan. One is a military reporter from Israel, the other an Australian who served in multiple combat tours in the country. Before we turn to them, however, I want to hand the mic over to Justin Kagan, CEO of Victoria CSG, to say a few words about his organisation and Greg Sher. Justin. Thank you, Brian. Thanks so much for this opportunity and good evening to everyone. Um, first, wanted to take an opportunity to thank the Zionist Federation of Australia for giving um, CSG and myself this opportunity to partner in this event. Um, Keith was a very good friend of Greg's and, and is a very good friend of the CSG. Uh, so thank you to, to Keith for another opportunity to, to hear from you. I'm also grateful to have the opportunity to say a few words about Greg um, in whose honor this event is being held. Greg first joined the CSG uh, and graduated from his basic training uh, towards the end of 1997. He took some time off in 1998 to pursue army commitments, um, but he then rejoined the group and, and went on to become a Krav Maga instructor in the CSG in early 2000. Greg continued his CSG involvement as a dedicated protector in between army commitments and trained hundreds of CSG volunteers uh, in Krav Maga over the years. Greg instilled in the protectors that he trained the importance of integrity and determination in the fight, that you should never give up no matter how dire the situation. He was an excellent teacher, and when he took on a full-time role in the CSG, he continued to teach not only Krav Maga, but also now also how to lead and function under stress. Greg was an employee of the CSG from the beginning of 2007 until March 2008, and he, when he had decided towards the end of 2007 that he wanted to deploy to Afghanistan. In his time as a staff member, he played an integral role in setting up the foundation for the CSG's approach to working with its volunteers into the future. The attributes that Greg displayed and tried to pass on, honesty, integrity, drive, leadership and determination, are attributes that every single protector in the CSG still, till today, strives to uphold. The five values of the CSG are mission integrity, team integrity, resilience, respect and professionalism. Greg embodied all of these values. There can be nothing greater, I believe, than to have made a difference with one's life. And Greg certainly did, instilling CSG protectors with the necessary skills, which in turn gave them pride in their organization, pride in their community, confidence in themselves, and ultimately the confidence to be proud Jews in whatever way they chose. In 2009, Greg was tragically killed in action in Afghanistan. Greg's legacy lives on in the CSG till today with the Greg Sher Dugma Award, which is awarded to CSG's volunteers to embody all the that Greg has uh, that Greg had as a CSG volunteer, a person who we all look up to due to their professionalism, drive, commitment, humbleness, and passion for the mission of the CSG. In the CSG head office, there is a picture of Greg that hangs that all CSG volunteers can see every time they enter the office to get ready to go out on shift. It hangs there as a reminder to all of us in the group what it means to be a volunteer of the CSG. Greg is the epitome of this and the lasting impact he has had on the group will never be forgotten. Brian, I'll hand over to you now. Thank you, Justin. Justin mentioned that uh, Greg is known by Keith Wallahan, who is one of our guests this evening. Keith has earned economics, law and politics degrees from the universities of Melbourne, Monash and Cambridge, and was admitted as a barrister in 2010 when he specialised in commercial trials. Hoping to hang up his wig, Keith is the endorsed Liberal candidate for the federal electorate of Menzies, centering in Melbourne's Doncaster region. But Keith is with us tonight primarily because of his time in the Australian Army. After qualifying as a commando, he served several periods of full-time service within the Special Operations Command, including one tour of Timor-Leste and three combat tours in Afghanistan. Speaking to Keith is Anna Arenheim. Anna is the military reporter for the Jerusalem Post. She grew up in Canada and earned a Bachelor in Criminology and Criminal Justice there before moving to Israel and completing a Master's in Counterterrorism and Homeland Security at the Interdisciplinary Centre in Herzliya. 
I'm going to take a back seat in this conversation and will only pop up to ask the occasional question. Please feel free to ask those questions using the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen. And if you see a question you like, press the thumbs up pictogram next to it. That way the question will rise to the top of the queue. So with no further ado, I'll get the conversation started. Anna, over to you. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm very glad to be here and to be joined by, uh, by Keith, who I'm sure we have a lot uh, to learn from. Um, Keith, why don't we, we speak a little bit about your, your time in Afghanistan? What was it like uh, being there and, and being in, in a country which is uh, at war? What did you do on a day-to-day -day basis uh, as a soldier and uh, just as, as, as a regular uh, human being interacting with uh, the everyday Afghanis? Oh, thanks, Anna, and, and thanks, Bren, and everyone for having me. It's a, a wonderful turnout tonight, and I'm, I'm really honoured to be here. Uh, we can all only give our personal perspective, and uh, on my second of three tours, I um, someone wrote a book about the tour, and I remember opening it up and reading it, and it felt like I was reading someone else's tour, and it's because all of us have a different experience. On a mission, someone at one corner or in a helicopter or uh, you know, in an overwatch position, will have an entirely different view of that conflict. So just to give a summary of Australia's military role in Afghanistan, it really kicked off from October 2001, primarily with uh, aircraft and SAS soldiers going over for the initial invasion. It then morphed into the nation building exercise that has there's a lot of commentary and opinion pieces being written about now, and I'm sure we'll go into that. And, and that really took off from 2005, six, and it also coincided when the Taliban really came back from primarily Pakistan and surged again. So you saw an, a, a surge in NATO forces and a surge in Taliban activity. Australia contributed to that all the way through to October 2013. And there was two streams. There was the Special Operations Task Group, which did 20 tours. And there was the Mentoring and Training Task Force, which did uh, about eight month tours. So there was probably less but each tour was there for longer. Um, most soldiers and officers, if you ask their experiences, it would be in one of those groups, but many other people had experiences in training or embed roles. So my personal experience, the first one was as the operations officer for the sixth of 20 special operations rotations. And that's primarily in a headquarters surrounded by plasma screens. Uh, on those screens, you'd see drone footage of the conflict. I'd get reports from the tactical elements in the ground, which would be commandos and SAS, and I'd also get missions approved. But our primary role was to support those soldiers in the fight to make sure they had the air assets and medical assets that they needed. The second tour was quite different. I was a platoon commander out in the field and, um, and really um, I wouldn't have been there if, if it wasn't for a year earlier when, when Greg uh, had died. I, I remember getting that call and deciding I never wanted to be on that end of the call again. And, um, and so a year later, I found myself with Greg's friends uh, on a tour of Afghanistan as a platoon commander. And that's an entirely different perspective. You actually see the country, you see people, you talk to them, and you learn a little bit about what life is like in Afghanistan and, and Urizgon, which is, there's only one way to describe it. It's medieval living. It's people live there like they have lived for probably thousands of years. The third tour was different again. Uh, I was a staff officer again, but this time embedded in an American special operations task group. My ID had a, an American flag behind it. And, and, and that was quite an experience um, because you realize that their mission and their focus is quite different to ours uh, in that it's, it's all on them. And, and, and I think that matters for how we discuss the withdrawal of Afghanistan. And, and I'll just leave you with this on that tour. When I'd go into that headquarters, which was at Bagram Air Base, it was a massive cube building and you'd leave your phones and keys at the front. And when you entered the corridor, there was plasma screens showing September 11 images. And this was late 2014. And I'd walk down that corridor, reminded of September 11 every day, and they were. And then you turn a corridor and see all of their killed in action special forces soldiers. And that corridor just went on and on and on. And that's how they went to work every day, reminded of those two things, the, the initial attack and then the sacrifice that came afterwards. Uh, so that was quite an eye opener um, being 
an Australian in that task group. So ha happy to focus in on any other details from those. I, I want to just delve in a little bit more about your interaction uh, when you went out in the field and you said it was medieval like. Um, and I'm sure, you know, all these years later, not much has changed. But in the few years uh, that there was a little bit, if we can say a little bit of quiet um, in Afghanistan, and we saw that nation building exercise happening, uh, and the women and the girls being able to go to school and to actually dream of having um, an active future to where they could do something for their country. Did you feel that on the ground when you were there too, that the, the women and the girls were excited that they were dreaming or were they concerned maybe that all of this would end at some point and they would just go back to where it was 20, 25 years ago? Uh, yes and no, it, it depends where you were in Afghanistan. So that tour as a platoon commander, myself and the other platoon commander, we arrived a month early and we went to Kabul to do a counterinsurgency leaders course. And that was the first time I'd been in the streets of Kabul and, and looked at Kabul and I saw signs of EU sponsored girls schools and uh, all the sorts of freedoms you would imagine in you know, a free city and it was quite impressive. Uh, after the month there and we came back to Uruzgan, uh, that's different again. Um, only 10% of people in Afghanistan live in around the city of Kabul, the rest live in a rural life with a rural setting. And I got the sense that those programs that you see all the posters for in Kabul weren't reaching out into rural Afghanistan. Uh, task groups like the Australian Mentoring Task Group did its best to build schools and encourage um, freedoms and uh, property rights and courts and a judicial system, but it, it, it was not the same as Kabul. So when we would go out on missions in our cars or helicopters, a lot of those programs, even in Tarrant Cap, weren't reaching out into the rural areas. And, and some people, you know, you, you went into areas and no one was going to school, no one at all. And at a, a certain time, when the Canadians left Afghanistan, Kandahar province became an area we went to a lot more. And throughout that area, again, I saw many village elders tell me that no one has been to school since the 1980s. And they would say very proudly how they could speak count to 10 in English and had basic skills, but, but were really just devastated that generations of children, boys and girls, have not had an education. And that was, that was heartbreaking to hear that in 2019. And, and do you think that's why we saw the Taliban rise up and really uh, reconquer Afghanistan so quickly? I mean, city after city, province after province just seem to have opened their doors pretty much uh, to the Taliban. But if you're saying nobody was educated, nobody really knew what was happening uh, in the outside world, except for those in Kabul, do you think that's why they had that ability to come in so quickly? Because they were there to begin with, the, the families uh, knew who they were, um, accepted what, they, what the Taliban it offered. Is, is that why we saw what we saw? It seems like a lot of people in the United States and Australia that we pay to um, give us the best advice on why something would happen got it wrong. And there's many reasons for that. Uh, I think what I said to you was, was our personal experience. In Tarrant Cap, there were schools and people were um, you know, having a better life and a better education, but so many weren't. I think when you look at why the Taliban took over so quickly, I think that you can trace that back to the negotiations that the United States were having with the Taliban in Doha that excluded the Afghan government. I think from there on, it's rational for anyone who's a junior soldier or an officer in the Afghan army or police, and, and they were taking many more multiples of casualties in the last few years than NATO or American soldiers were. You would ask yourself, what is this going to look like for me on the other side of America leading? And it didn't look good. It's rational to expect that there would be a takeover. Um, but more than that, when I would speak with village elders, and you'd mentioned the word Taliban, it, it, it was like I was mentioning it, a political party, a political party that had legitimacy. So when we were having discussions and we, we were there to promote the Afghan government, they would tell us how corrupt they thought they were. How Hamid Karzai would just give the whole province away to a relative of his. How it's about who you know. 
And I was reminded that the Taliban came to power really on a, an anti-corruption agenda. It obviously morphed into something much more extreme. But there's a feeling for normal people in Afghanistan that they're all the same. Like anyone in any democracy would say, you know, a lot of the political parties, they're all the same. And that's the feeling I got about the Taliban. They didn't see it like we saw it. So when the ultimate collapse happened, I, it obviously caught everyone off guard. It was so quick, but it was, I think, that die was cast 18 months ago. And when you, when you spoke, you mentioned about uh, how the Afghan police and the security forces had a lot more casualties uh, than NATO or, or US soldiers. They also had a lot of training by NATO, by, by the US, by Australia, and also from Canada. I, I'm Canadian. Um, and I remember, you know, growing up in Canada, seeing all the, the training and all the help that Canada is giving to Afghanistan. But now that we saw the collapse, what are the chances that you're going to have former soldiers or former officers defect to the Taliban and work with them and train them on all the weaponry and all the platforms that they were given? I think that's happened on a massive scale already. Um, and maybe even in a coordinated way, you know, from senior generals down, uh, that that's happened. And, you know, there was a lot of memes that would float around from veterans groups and they showed the Taliban security behind the new Taliban leadership and they had, you know, their fingers outside the trigger guard and, and that's something Western forces teach soldiers. And, and, you know, that's an obvious clue for anyone who's trained someone that uh, they are now with the Taliban. Uh, one of the things I think has been um, that people have thought about as to what went wrong was that it was a Western military that was built, which we know has a huge logistics and technological chain that requires people to look after equipment. So, for example, a lot of helicopters and maybe some drones and other things have been left there. But other than one or two that have gone for a joyride, they're very quickly going to you know, something's going to go wrong. The widget that requires someone who did a four-year degree isn't there to fix it. Um, and the particular fuel that you have to put in isn't there and it's not being refined. So I think it was a modern military built without all of the architecture behind it. And the United States was fulfilling that architecture. But more importantly, it wasn't just the architecture, it was the money. Uh, that, that military cost a lot of money, and there's a reason $2 trillion uh, was spent in the last two decades. And I want to talk about money. I wrote an analysis when uh, the fall of Kabul happened that one of the, the issues with the Taliban is Afghanistan is not a rich country. And the Taliban is not an organization that will get money from abroad. They're not, aid organizations are not going to come in and shower Afghanistan with money anymore. So in order to run a country like Afghanistan, what are they going to do? Where are they going to get this money? Are they going to sell all the platforms and weaponry that, they, that they've, you know, uh, that they got? Or will they... Uh, how, just how will they function? How will Afghanistan continue to be a country, uh, you know, with aid, able to eat, able to have water? That's a, that's a good question as well. And, and I think there's two parts to it. There's the short term immediate requirement to keep the country ticking over, to keep public servants, especially in Kabul, paid to do their job, to keep electricity and water and all of the other things moving. Uh, I think that's going to require help from other countries, whether it's Pakistan or China or other countries, and they've got interests now that they can use that cash to leverage with. Long term, one of the assets they have is it's, it's a resource intensive country. Um, there's a lot of minerals in Afghanistan that would help with um, a lot of microchips and other things like that. And, and it already, I think China has shown an interest in helping mine some of those assets. But the number one friend for Afghanistan and the Taliban is Pakistan. So I think Pakistan will take a very keen interest in, um, in what happens from here on, including money supply. Uh, there's one question here uh, from Paul Newfield uh, for you. If, was it all worth it? This whole time that um, Australia, Canada, America, the West was in Afghanistan, so many people died. So many people have um, mental uh, effects from their time in Afghanistan. 
And now, like Paul said, back to square one. What do you think as someone who was there, who fought there, um, it, it, was it worth it in the end? That's a really hard question. And I know on this call is Felix Show, Greg's dad and Barry, his, his brother and, and many other friends and family. Um, and, and there's so many others that are in that same position. And, and you answer that question, I'll give you my honest answer. My, my honest answer is that knowing what we knew at the time, absolutely it was worth it. But that doesn't mean you don't learn lessons in hindsight. And I think from an Australian perspective, was it worth it? We, we, we had to reinforce our relationship with the United States. And, and even throughout the very earliest stages of the war, that, that was a reason for us to do what we were doing. But for people like Greg, I remember speaking, to, I did my first tour and then I remember bumping into Greg on the parade ground and I just come back. And when he asked me about what Afghanistan was like, I remember his eyes lighting up. He was so interested and excited, full of life about the possibility of going. He was so keen to go and, and I was too. And, and there's many on this call that were, and um, we weren't thinking about 20 years from now, looking back about whether it's worth it. It's just not a consideration at the time from an individual perspective. You're going because that's what you signed up to do. You're going because that's the flag that's on your uniform and you're going because your friends are going and you just couldn't bear to let them go without you. And all of that, that was all the motivation you needed, service and friendship or mateship. And, and I know and those things um, just made that answer an easy one to make then. But looking back, you know, from a strategic perspective, um, I think it's worth it if we learn the lessons and if we acknowledge the failures. And there's an important, there's important operational and tactical lessons. And I, um, when I did some of my postgrad study, I put pen to paper on what went wrong. And this was in 2012, before my third tour. And it, it seemed to me, putting my lawyer hat on, that there was um, some mistakes made in the early years. And there was two that stood out. One was that um, the opportunity for nation building really was those early years from 2001 to 2006 for two reasons. One was the Taliban weren't there. They, their leadership was hiding away in Pakistan. So there was a vacuum. Secondly, the population, there was lots of surveys done at the time that the, the locals were open to nation building, or at least more than they were later. And, and that was simple things. I remember going to villages where you would see um, uh, farming irrigation channels where someone would put some dirt in from a shovel and it would move down to the next field. And there'd be disputes between valleys about who would get water at what time. There was no courts or mechanism to solve those disputes, but the Taliban would come in and say, well, we will hear both sides and we'll make a decision. And the sign of any respected legitimate judicial system is that the loser feels happy with it. And the sense we got was that the losers were happy with the Taliban saying, resolving these disputes. And that was something that was missed, it's something that militaries don't do well, they do fighting well, but they don't do courts and institutions well. But finally, I think it was set up for failure from the constitution that was, well, not really voted on, but it was the constitution that set up the 2004 elections. Afghanistan is one of the most decentralized societies on earth where tribal identification matters so much more than anything else. And I've spoken about the difference between Kabul and rural Afghanistan. But the constitution was an extremely centralized constitution that had all power in the president. You didn't even get to elect the um, regional governors. They were appointed. Um, there was no other involvement or identity. And that did two things. It made a sense. It delegitimized, you know, Hamid Karzai's control over the diverse country. But it also meant when it fell, you couldn't carve out other regions. And I think that was a missed opportunity in the negotiations to say, well, the Taliban, you can have certain areas like Kandahar and Helmand, but it's going to be two years before you get Kabul and we'll have a small presence in Bagram for that. Um, the constitution didn't allow that sort of negotiation. Uh, and I think that's a lesson we all need to learn if ever this happens again. It's interesting when, you, when you're talking about, you know, carving up certain parts of Afghanistan and the decentralization of the country, uh, there's a lot of talk now about Pan Panjshir, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, with the son of Ahmad Mansoud, uh, Ahmad Masood, uh, you know, putting up a rebellion against the Taliban. And there, there's a lot of fighting taking place there right now. And, and it makes me wonder, what are the chances that 
the son of one of the more respected uh, fighters of, of the early 2000s before he was assassinated, um, what are the chances that he will be able to resist? And there will be that one area in Afghanistan which will you know, not fall under Taliban control and they might be able to still have a little bit of, uh, of I wouldn't say freedom, but just not under Talib rule where women can still go to school, where there could be a bit more uh, education or, or is that just, just a dream? I'd like to think that that's a possibility. I, I don't think so. I think even reading articles today in the news, um, uh, Pakistan has contributed heavily to that offensive against them because the, you, you can't have a rebellion in your own country like that. Because let's face it, the Taliban have taken over, but it's not by an election. It was just handed over to them. So there's this assumption that, you know, they have this legitimacy in the country and that's never been tested. And again, I think that goes to the failure of the negotiation that, you know, we didn't say, well, the United States didn't say, well, you say you have the support of the people. Well, let's test it and we'll help have an election where you are a political party that, that um, goes to the people and, and tests it. Um, but I think when you have a centralised constitution, you hand over a country en masse like that, um, I don't think there's any room for pockets of freedom and resistance to last much longer, unfortunately. And also a lot of the leaders of a resistance like that got on planes and left in the last few weeks. I'm going to take another question um, from Shelly Shmulevich about uh, China. Uh, if China would really go in and uh, take over the funding of, of, of Afghanistan, we, we spoke about that earlier, uh, instead of Pakistan. I mean, I, I personally see Pakistan as really having uh, the most influence on Afghanistan, especially with how, how they are with the Taliban. But China is very active in the last few years and in, in growing their power, uh, even here in the Middle East. And I want to talk to you after this question about the ramifications of the Afghan withdrawal on the Middle East. But Pakistan is not such a big international player like China. But will China really go in and take over from Pakistan? I, I think if you take a step back from Pakistan's role, I think you have to look at the you know, the, the great power conflicts of China and the United States, but also India. I think the movements we've had with the Quad, particularly, you know, Australia's involvement with India, India's, India's actual hot battle that they had in the mountains with Chinese soldiers. And that was quite a bloody conflict that's happened quite recently. Uh, I think if I was a Chinese official, I'd be very worried about how we react and deal with India. And I'd be worried about the Quad. And... Pakistan's known hostility to India would be attractive to China in itself, regardless of all of the minerals and lithium and other things that are in Afghanistan, I would want to help Pakistan. So I think a lot of what will drive China's interest in Afghanistan will be having one eye on India through Pakistan and, and a way of keeping India in check from uh, assisting the United States or Australia too much. Um, because every action has a reaction and the quad is quite new, but I think we, we will see a reaction to the quad with other coalitions formed and Pakistan and China makes a lot of sense. I'm just going to roll off of that. Every action has a reaction and let's talk about how uh, the US withdrawal from Afghanistan and really their pivot to China will have an effect on the Middle East with Iran really uh, being emboldened, I think, by this withdrawal and by the fact now that we saw uh, Anthony Blinken saying, you know what, you know what, we're at the point that we're, we might just not have, have a deal with Iran. I mean, coming from Israel, I think, and, and I've spoken to military officials here, that the withdrawal from Afghanistan really does concern the Israeli military, not because of Iran per se, but that the weapons and the weapons which can make its way to the Middle East, to Sinai or to Syria to be used against Israel, or even just becoming a terror hub again uh, that we saw pre 9-11 and that can affect everywhere in the world, including Australia. Do, are you feeling the same thing in Australia that the, the pullback of American forces from the Middle East is having a negative effect? 
there's a lot of parts to that and most of it we don't know and we'll see it play out. I, I think for a country like Australia or for Israel um, or Taiwan and Japan, South Korea, you would be looking at the way that the United States withdrew from a few perspectives. One was the botched negotiation and, and that's not a partisan thing. You know, Trump started it, um, his administration kicked it off and then Biden finished it. But the thing that was most concerning was that when the facts changed, they didn't change their mind. And, and that's something, you know, Ronald Reagan was very proud of, you know, when the facts change, you change your mind. And I think Trump did that in Iraq when the withdrawal there wasn't going too well, he listened and went back in again. I thought when we saw those scenes in Kabul, I thought President Biden would have adjusted his stance, would have said, we're not pulling out like that. It's not what we thought it was gonna be. So we won't cut and run. But there was a, almost a bloody mindedness about it, which did give other countries, you know, um, you know cause to, to reflect on what would happen in future conflicts. And, and you could say, of course, that means the United States is pivoting to China and Asia, but, but well, let's see, because so many times the United States, it says it's pivoting to the Pacific and Asia, and it doesn't really materialize. It does get drawn back into the Middle East. From an Israeli perspective, you know, I, I, I would like to think that the United States can chew gum and walk at the same time. It's a big enough military that it can protect its friends and its interests in the Middle East and protect its friends and its interests in the Pacific. It's always done that. And it's got the wealth and resources and manpower to do that. It doesn't mean you're fighting two major wars. It just means you have an interest. And I think that's the thing a lot of us don't understand yet is that the United States had interests in Afghanistan beyond Afghanistan. And, and a smaller presence uh, probably would have been worth the sacrifice, but it's hard for us to tell another country to make a sacrifice. I had a, a briefing with, with senior military officials just about two weeks ago, and was it a week ago? No, two weeks ago, and they were saying that the United States might want to, live, to leave the Middle East, but the Middle East won't leave the United States. There are so many issues, um, even if you take the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and put it to the side, there are so many issues in the Middle East itself. If you should just look at Lebanon, which is you know, used to be the Paris of the Middle East and, and Beirut now is plunged into darkness. And that, uh, you know, when Lebanon fully collapses, it'll be just like, in, in my opinion, just like in Afghanistan, completely decentralized. It's gonna be Canton, uh, Canton in the North, in the South, in the center, everything is going to be, it's just gonna be a disaster in Lebanon and, and America can't leave the Middle East. But when you look at Iraq, for example, Iraq has a bit more, in, in, similarities, I think, to Afghanistan, there was also a nation building exercise. And what happened in the end, we saw the rise of ISIS, uh, now the collapse of ISIS. Uh, do you think that going in and, and, and having a stronger foothold in Iraq might stop it from becoming another Afghanistan? Because if Iraq fully collapses, unlike Lebanon, it will have a huge impact uh, across the Middle East. I, th I think having some presence in the region is important for, for a simple tactical reason that you want aircraft and drones um, uh, to be able to move to an area quickly. And if the United States doesn't have a physical presence in the region, that, that just can't happen. Um, I am um, in that US task group that I was in at any one time, there was 10 drones in the sky all beaming into the headquarters. And the pilots were in Nevada, um, but the drones would take off from Afghanistan. And, and that was important because it takes a long, they're slow moving things. It takes a while to get them there. Um, and, and that gives a sense of security and peace that knowing that those are there, I wouldn't like drones to be up in the sky in Australia, but if it was the difference between having my family blown apart, you know, from a civil war or some other war, I'd, I'd live with it. Um, that's going to be a lot harder if they don't have a physical presence in the region. Um, you just can't move assets over a country quickly. You need to have boots on the ground. Oh, no, you don't necessarily need boots on the ground, but it's a different perspective. Um, you know, it's uh, a lot of things are done from those drones, but it's, it's not perfect. Um, it's nicer to have 
a presence on the ground, but that can be through diplomatic channels as well. And, and, I, and I think that's probably what we need to see from the United States as well is the State Department filling the gap because there's lots of leverage the United States has through its soft power, through its diplomats and through its culture as well. It, it used to be what it leveraged more than anything. And I'd like to see the United States return to leveraging that soft power as well as their hard power. And I've never been to Australia, but talk to me a little bit about what is the what are the relations between Australia and, and the U.S.? Uh, I know that Canada is welcome around the world. Whenever I used to travel, I used to travel very proudly with my Canadian flag patched onto my bag. But in, in Australia, is the United States military uh, is it is it something that the Australian public support? I'm sure that the, the Jewish uh, communities in Australia support the Israeli military, but what about the Australian public? Do they support the Israeli military as well as the Americans? Well, it's very hard to speak you know, for everyone. Um, and especially I, I wasn't born in Australia. I came here when I was 10. Like I think Greg came with his family from South Africa when he was about eight or nine. And, and, and that was one of the things we bonded over was uh, we came from three boys, liked 80s movies and... Um, and had joined the army, um, but but I, I think I think there is a recognition deep in Australian society that our security relies upon a close relationship with the United States. Um, we we don't have the weaponry or the population to protect ourselves independently. Um, we do have a landmass that gives us a lot of advantages for being protected, but you don't just look at protection for the soil of Australia. It's also, you know, sea communications and um, we rely on trade so much for our economy and, and allowing that sort of trade to go through the South China Sea is very important. So our interests do align with, you know, having free movement between Taiwan and Japan and Singapore and, and Vietnam. And, and so a safe and secure Pacific is in our interests. And, and I think people do see that as a very positive thing. And there hasn't been, there's American presence in Australia, there's bases in Australia, there's Marines in the Northern Territory. And other than one or two extremists, you very rarely see any criticism or protests about that. And, and I think that's the measure of Australian support because we, we don't mind doing a protest and that's happening with the lockdowns, but it's um, you never see it for those military exercises with the US except for one or two people. And what about the Israeli military? What's the support like in the Australian public for, for the IDF? I don't know about the wider public, but I know in the military, when I was there, there was um, enormous respect uh, because a lot of the, the equipment and technology that we would see um, in our military was actually designed and built in Israel. And, and, and I, it was always at a cutting edge of technology that we aspired to. But I think Israel is important for Australia from here on because the United States withdrawal from Afghanistan in the way that it occurred has made us all from parliamentarians and candidates to people in the community reassess what we need to do to stand on our own two feet. Doesn't mean we expect the United States to cut and run, but it's quite clear the United States has said it that they expect their friends to stand up for themselves first and then they will come and help. And Israel has been doing that for decades and very effectively. And, and I, for such a small population in such a hostile area, there's a lot of lessons for Australia to learn from Israel in the coming years. It's interesting because I, when the, the fall happened, I remember, you know, thinking to myself, well, this sounds very familiar for Israel. If you look just at, at Lebanon or the Gaza disengagement and, and when, for, when, Israel left Lebanon, it did so in a way that at the end of the day allowed Hezbollah uh, to come in and uh, set up camp in South Lebanon um, and take and grow its arsenal to close to 130,000 rockets and missiles and mortars all aimed at the Israeli home front. Um, and, and it's concerning that the United States, such a close ally of Israel, did not think that that could happen in Afghanistan. Uh, that when leaving without really preparing for the day after and, and not really thinking, okay, well, the Taliban can get our weaponry, can get our advanced weaponry and could uh, even give, bring it to Iran, 
and Afghanistan and Iran, their borders are, are quite porous. Do you think that American weaponry can make its way to, to Iran? That they can reverse engineer any of the, the platforms that were destroyed by US soldiers and make them functional? Because we've seen that happen in Gaza. You know, Israeli drones uh, are, that fall in Gaza and, they're, and then we reverse engineered and flown right back into Israel. I think we saw imagery, I certainly did, of convoys of American equipment moving from Afghanistan over the Iranian border, particularly, you know, functioning vehicles, small arms, um, rocket launches, those sort of things. I think the high-end technology, so like the Reaper drones or some of the other sophisticated equipment, I don't think the United States left that, not, not certainly not on a large scale. And it, just from the imagery, it didn't look like that was going across the border. Um, I think what we've seen is, you know, helicopters like Black Hawk helicopters, which, you know, I still think are fantastic things, but they've been around for decades and you probably could buy them if you had enough money um, and then you need to service them. So I don't think there's a risk, a large risk of significant weaponry going to Iran. That said, you can do a lot of damage with a huge arsenal of small arms. Um, I mean, we've seen it in many countries, many terrorist acts where a small group of people with machine guns can shut a whole city down. And uh, when you look at that equipment in Afghanistan, um, I I'd hate to think that, you know, particularly in, from Europe's perspective, we see, imagine 20 or 30 of those on, in Paris or um, in Rome or somewhere else, it would, it would be just unimaginable. It doesn't take much. Um, Iran doesn't need small arms, but it's certainly got a lot more now. Yeah, you know, there, there's a trial happening right now in Paris of, over the, the Bataclan attacks, and, and those were carried out with small arms. Mm. Um, it would be horrifying to think if all of those arms could make their way back into, into Europe. Uh, again, like I said, the, the, the Israeli military is very concerned about the arms trafficking. Um, if you look at what happened in Libya in 2011, it took just a few weeks for for RPGs, rocket propelled grenades, and, and other arms to make its way into Gaza. Uh, and it was already under blockade at that point. So when, coming from the Israeli perspective, that's a very, very big concern. Uh, I want to take another question here from Adam Ensley, uh, where he asked, even though the Sunni alliance is strong from the Afghans uh, to Pakistan, we see an alliance in the Middle East stronger with the Shiites of Iran. Can we be misled here? What, what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that goes to the diversity of Afghanistan. It's, you, you can't, um, you know, there's a strong Sunni presence, particularly in the South, in the, the Pashtuns, but you, you know, there's a Shia presence too in, in, in the North. And I, I think um, Afghanistan is one of those countries that probably wouldn't exist if, if different decisions had been made back in the day. It, you, there's an argument that there's, there's a nation there of Pashtunistan, which is the Northern part of, Pakistan and the southern part of Afghanistan really is this nation within a nation that has an identity. And that's why you saw enormous movement of people across the border from southern Afghanistan. It's also why you saw Helmand and Kandahar as where the, the most fierce conflict occurred and the most NATO and US lives were lost. Um, again, time will tell as to how the Sunni Shia um, alliances will play out with Afghanistan. I think as long as you've got the Taliban um, there, I think they will be driven more by those short-term and medium-term interests of, of finance and money. And they'll be tempted by alliances with China and Pakistan more than I think religious alliances. I'm going to ask about social media and the internet and uh, things that we didn't really have as much back in uh, 2001. And again, after the, the 20 years of, uh, of openness, um, mainly in, in the cities of, of Afghanistan, we're seeing now a lot of uh, demonstrations, a lot by a lot of women coming out to the street and calling on the Taliban to let them continue uh, with their lives and with their jobs. Uh, but you see the Taliban uh, taking up their whips and, and stopping these protests and, and do you think that the Taliban might be able to be uh, convinced or uh, maybe not convinced is the right word but do you think that there is a chance 
uh, for women and, and for the secular Afghans in the big cities to continue with what they had or will the Taliban revert uh, Afghan will, will bring Afghanistan back to, to 2000 and 2001? I think this is one of those things we, we want to see play out. And, you know, we, we ask about what was the benefits of the last 20 years. And one of those is a taste of freedom. Um, you know, once you see it, maybe you can unsee it. Uh, but once you experience it and feel it, uh, how, do you, how do you give that life away? That there are people who were born with so much more freedoms and spent their whole lives are now in their 20s. You know, the, the 1990s, uh, you know, that's a different generation ago. Um, so to just revert back to the 1990s, that's not an easy thing. It, we'll see what happens. You know, social media goes both ways. I, I remember watching, you know, the, the Arab Spring and there was a lot of promise of, you know, democracy and freedoms coming with that. And, and it quickly flipped back to more extremist regimes. Um, so so the, these things can go up and down and backwards and sideways. And, and I don't think social media is the necessarily the answer it obviously starts with young people but uh, even in 2014 the, the task group the united states task group i know they were getting i'm not giving away too much but social media was you know the taliban were on social media the pakistan military were on social media and sometimes when there was something that happened near the border the first time you'd hear about it would be Tal the pakistani military would tweet about it and um you know that, that's that's great real-time intelligence but it's it's not just young people who value freedom that use social media. I hope that is the case. I hope that taste of freedom for a few decades um, is not something that can be trampled on easily. But, but again, I think that the leaders of the nation got on the planes and got out, which is great, but it's also sad because it means that they're not there um, to help make Afghanistan a better place. I mean, when you when you hear the, I think it was Ghani that that fled right away in, in a helicopter with bags of cash, and then just the other day uh, releases a statement only in English, apologizing for him fleeing the country. It really makes you think that these leaders really lead their country, or you know, back back to the Arab Spring that you mentioned just before. I remember someone there was a report of someone who named his kid Facebook. In Egypt uh, because of how Facebook drove the Arab Spring and it it's really scary that it happened so long ago and the ramifications that we're feeling that are so present on an everyday day-to-day -day basis especially here in the Middle East especially when you look at Syria for example Syria had a huge uprising and then a decade of civil war uh, where, where hundreds of thousands were killed or, or displaced and it, when you look at that from an Israeli perspective, and I mean, I could drive to the Syrian border, to the Lebanese border in one day and then come and then drive back home. But when you look at Afghanistan, which is a huge country as compared to, to Israel, which is a tiny country, um, and the fact that, that, like you yourself said, that social media and, and it is really in the, the bigger cities like Kabul and, and Kandahar and, and the smaller villages where 75% of the population live. It makes me wonder if they're happy with, with what happened, with how things have turned out, that, that they're back to, you know, the entire country is back again in the way that they knew it. Do you, do you see the same thing? Or do you think that the people in the villages in Afghanistan were are, are not so happy with how things turned out and would have rather have that that uh, continued freedom and continued Afghan spring, if you want to put it that way. I think right now that this enormous dust storm has happened and, and it hasn't the dust hasn't settled. And, and I think if I lived in Afghanistan in Kabul or out in rural Kandahar or Uruzgana, I'd just be waiting to see how this takes shape because uh, very few countries are successful one-party states. Uh, every party, including in democracies, you know, have factions and break up and fight with each other. Um, th there will be extreme and moderate elements of the Taliban. We already have seen ISIS-K as a separate element that wants to flex its muscles. Uh, you know, I'm quite worried that the worst is still to come for Afghanistan. 
um, with all of those weapons, all of that equipment, and 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 once the dust has settled, there will be a competition for power. And again, I, I think that missed opportunity to have some sort of federation where you could you could tell people, you know, people in Kandahar, you don't have to tell people in Kabul have to live. And people in Kabul, you don't have to tell people in Kandahar how to, how to live. And if you're not happy with that, well, you travel to whatever province suits you. That's the beauty of a federation. And, and the United States learned that from bitter experience. They had their own civil war where hundreds of thousands died. And it was a federation that allowed them to live together and call themselves Americans. Um, people are complaining to me as a candidate and, and both political parties about our broken federation. But, um, you know, it's as an institution, it, it's, it's a way that lets people live in a way that they like. And, you know, people from Melbourne aren't, you know, from Townsville and, or Perth and, and we're all different and it allows us to have a legitimate government that reflects us. And, and, and again, I think we'll be paying the price for that. Afghanistan would be paying the price for that 2004 centralised constitution. Not that the Taliban will be observing it much. Can I just jump in here, Anna and Keith? Um, we skirted around this issue a little bit, but I was hoping to get Anna's opinion on it. Given the, um, the lessons of the withdrawal and the Taliban takeover, and of course, all the arms that were left over, some of which have gone to Iran and so on. Anna, do you think that the various Iranian proxy militias, obviously, particularly um, Hezbollah, will become more active as a result? Or do you think the Israeli army are going to, or what lessons will the Israeli army incorporate as a result of, of the withdrawal from Afghanistan? I, I think that it's uh, something that will embolden Iran and therefore all of its proxies uh, like Hezbollah and even the uh, Afghani Shiite militia that we have in, in Syria and in South Syria, the, the Fight Immune Brigade, I think it will embolden them. Um, I think that they will see a, a window of opportunity to say, okay, well, maybe Israel right now is a little bit too busy, too concerned. I mean, Israel right now has six prisoners on the loose who escaped via tunnel. So we're, we're quite uh, focused on that issue right now. But I, I think that the Israeli army uh, like I said before, and this was a, a very senior officer who told me this, uh, when I asked what is the main concern for Israel, is he said that Afghanistan is, will be a terror hub. The weapons uh, will make their way to the Middle East, they always do. Uh, the, the black market will grow tremendously with the amount of arms and Hezbollah has great weaponry from Iran um, and I don't think we'll need the, the weapons coming out of Afghanistan, like we said, you know, small arms type of um, types of things. But I think that if Hezbollah takes a window of opportunity that, that there is right now and um, pushes Israel just a little bit more than it did in May uh, or in June when, when they fired uh, 20 missiles towards the north, I think that if they push Israel a little bit more, they're going to understand that the Israeli army, though it's, it's very um, busy right, right now within itself and with Gaza and the West Bank, they're not going to take, you know, they're not going to take it lightly. The Israeli military is uh, very prepared. It has a good amount of targets, uh, Lebanese targets, Lebanese infrastructure, civilian uh, dual use targets. Uh, used both by Hezbollah and both by uh, Lebanese civilians uh, that it would strike. I got a look at, at a, a few of them in my last briefing in the north. Um, I think Hezbollah is also very aware of that. That while they have grown, um, you know, into a terror army, the, the Israeli army has grown as well since the last war. I don't think that they're going to try to push Israel, push that button into another conflict. Thank you. Sorry for intervening in the conversation. I just <laughs> wanted to ask. <laughs> Keith, do you think, um, I mean, you mentioned before the lessons that Australia will take. Obviously, Australia has interests and so on, and the lessons that we should learn from Afghanistan. There must be war fighting lessons that the Armory has already incorporated um, over the last 20 years. Uh, will they be valuable going forward, or, will it, or is it true that, you know, armies always fight the last war? It's a good point. I remember. Um... 
back in the in 1998 I um I worked part-time I was at Melbourne Uni for a federal politician and um that person was saying well why don't we disband infantry battalions and put it more into tanks and um they'd just come from speaking to the school of armor and Pakapanyal and the war that everyone remembered was the 1991 Gulf War which was very tank heavy um sure enough one year later Australia was scrambling to form more infantry battalions to go to East Timor and then um, there was not much use for tanks in Afghanistan uh, so there is a real danger especially for politicians to fight the last war uh, I'm comforted by you know if you open up any newspaper in Australia that I don't think that's happening here I think there's an acknowledgement across all the political parties across all sorts of groups and think tanks that we have to be more creative than that and not get lost in the war we've just fought. Of course, the from a special forces perspective, it, it's it's quite a different world than it was in August 2001. Um, it's almost tripled in size. It's got much more equipment and capability, um, but it also came with a cost. It had a higher loss of life, including Greg and many others. Um, and there's some lessons of leadership and ethical failures, and they're playing out in the Brereton report. And and um, and that's not something that can be swept under the carpet. And you know that that has to be faced head on, particularly from uh, how we select and train officers and soldiers, and how we we deal with tough ethical decisions and and show leadership. So uh, there's lots of lessons to be learned, some good, some bad, um, but but we have to learn them. We can't just look the other way. Um, but from a an equipment perspective, um, a, a lot of people ask me, well, what can Australia do against a superpower like China? And, and of course, we can't by ourselves, you know, take on a superpower. That's just madness and suicide. Um, but, but we need to leverage all everything that we have from our soft power, from our diplomatic institutions and our embassies and our alliances like the Quad. But in terms of military capability, um, I'd like to think there's lessons from Israel and Singapore and um, there's lessons from metaphors. I, I have this really large 43 kilo dog and he'll never touch a bee or an ant or anything else that he could easily crush, but he knows it would sting him enough that makes it not worth the price. And I think Australia needs to have a military that is agile, responsive and able to last the distance in a way that makes us the bee for any big dog that wants to have a go. interesting i have a very small dog she is seven pounds eight pounds and she'll go after a pit bull um and it kind of reminds me of israel you know it's a very very small country but um she'll attack whatever whatever needs to be attacked in order to protect herself and that's something that you said too that it, it will israel will always protect itself and rely only on itself and nobody else, even though they Israel knows that there's um, kind of like a blood pact with the Americans, that the Americans will come and, and will help Israel if requested. But Israel would prefer to be on its own, would prefer to protect herself by its, you know, her, her men and women in the army. And I think that's something that's very, very Israeli, that mentality. And I think that when you look at Israelis all over the world, whenever they go out and travel, which is something that they love to do, they're also very aggressive, right? They're like that, my little dog, very aggressive. But uh, when you look at Canada and Australia, two large countries are polite, where we don't attack. That's absolutely true. Um... I think on that note, uh, I might call this conversation to a close. I could go for another couple of hours. I'd love to, but it is nine o'clock and we do like ending, um, ending on that note. Look, when I worked at the Department of Home Affairs, I became the lead researcher on Afghanistan and after that, Pakistan. Before I started, I was shown a map of Afghanistan and Pakistan, India and China, and I was told, and I subsequently learned for myself, the way geography and history and religion and national interests in the area have all overlapped and interacted with each other. And I think tonight we got a real glimpse of that, and not just how these Central Asian actors interact, but how the ramifications of that conflict have and will impact the Middle East and and even wider than the Middle East. So for this absolutely fascinating insight, I want to extend my thanks and the ZFA's thanks to both Anna and Keith. 
And I think the fact that we've got audience uh, with numbers well in excess of 200 people speaks to the genuine interest the community has in this topic. Um, and of course, how the negative ramifications might affect Israel. So if everyone in the various living rooms could, uh, could give Anna and Keith a, a virtual clap, I think uh, that would be very good. Now, tonight's webinar will be uploaded to our YouTube channel tomorrow. And in fact, what you'll find on that YouTube channel are the dozens of conversations, just like tonight's, that we've held over the last 18 months. And if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you will never miss another conversation. Speaking of conversations, this Sunday, we are holding an event that I think you might be interested in. Following on from the recent ZFA in Israel Aliyah Center Aliyah Fair, which was attended by over 180 Australian Olim and potential Olim, we are holding an interactive information session with Israel Cohen, the Aliyah Director at the Jerusalem Municipality. Now you can hear Aliyah advice and tips from four Australian Olim of various ages, each living in different parts of the city, and including how they adapted and transitioned to life in Jerusalem, both personally and professionally. This is an essential webinar for anyone contemplating Aliyah, even if Jerusalem won't be your destination city. Now, following this session, you'll be able to organize a one-on-one -on -one Zoom session with Israel Cohen uh, to delve into any individual Aliyah questions, if that is uh, useful to you. So please, please join us this Sunday from 8 p.m. AEST. You can register at zfa.com.au forward slash Aliyah story. So thank you again for joining us tonight. And thank you once again, Anna and Keith. Good night, everyone. For having us. Thank you, Anna. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Cheers. Thank you, everyone. Have a great night.